collaboration with the Cyprus Mail, this is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambos. There's a cultural slant to this week's program, with six weeks of theatre, music and dance and some surprises at the Kipria Festival. We are trying to find the unconventional uh, places to make these performances. We meet the new maestro with big plans for the Cyprus Symphony Orchestra. Offer regular family concerts to anyone who wants to attend as much as hopefully five times a year in a pretty regular scheme we will be collaborating with schools we will offer neighborhood concerts where we go into all kinds of neighborhoods and play outdoors and hear about a social outreach program bringing different faiths together to help vulnerable groups issues around care for elderly people, issues around care of dementia sufferers, issues around people with kind of mental health problems. It's that time of year again when the annual Kipria Festival gets underway, a month of culture all over Cyprus. The artistic director is Andy Vargilis. He joins us now. Actually, it's already started, Andy, but it goes on until October, so there's still plenty of time for people to catch what's coming up and what is coming up. Yes, that's true, and uh, uh, it ends at, uh, on the 14th of, uh, of October. That means that it's six weeks full of uh, performances. We started with uh, a special performance uh, with poetry and uh, music uh, dedicated to Gatsos, a very special poet of Greece, with uh, Manolis Mitsias and uh, Cariofilia Carambetti. Then we had uh, the um, Alexia show, uh, the untold story of women in jazz. And uh, then is coming the uh, story of the blues with the Zilla Project uh, group and uh, guest star Elias Zaikos from Greece. Then uh, we are having uh, several other performances, uh, theatre like the American Buffalo, written by David Mamet, with the famous Greek actors uh, Bezos and uh, Philippides. And then we have Caligula by Albert Camus, directed by Aliki Danesi Knudsen, starring Yanis Stangoglu. We have Blacklight Theatre from Prague, uh, a special performance for children and not only, of course, for the entire family. And what will they be doing? They will um, show very special performance that uh, is called The Best of Image. So they are the best short uh, shows of their entire repertory. So it's, uh, it's like anthology of uh, best parts of their shows. It sounds as if a lot of it is theatre and poetry and so on, and you've mentioned some music events. What about dance? Uh, we have dance. Uh, we have uh, one very special performance uh, directly from Montreal, Canada. It's a solo performance called ID Double. It's a, a very, very interesting show with Anne-Marie Langue. It's uh, about uh, the double identity a lady feels and uh, somehow in the story is mixed uh, with the Maria Callas uh, story. And we have also the very big show of um, Vertigo Dance Company from Israel. It's one of the most uh, known Israeli dance companies all over the world with a show named uh, Yama. That's uh, the last one we are having in, on the 14th of uh, October and it will uh, be for only one show in Patihio Theatre in Limassol. Uh, we have also Stamatis Kraunakis, it's again music, and uh, we have the um, Cyprus Symphony Orchestra with Cyprian Katsaris as a soloist. Then we have the so-called open to the public performances, no tickets required. The one is named Arizona uh, by Juan Carlo Rubio. It's uh, a site-specific uh, performance at Xenopoulos factory near Coquino Trimithia roundabout. And then we have another one by Mythos, which is called uh, Here and There. Uh, is based on uh, the Chronicle by Leontios Macheras, but in a very humoristic way done. 
and uh, this uh, performance will take place at uh, Castle Square in Limassol and Fane Romani Square in Nicosia. So it sounds as if not only is it all over Cyprus, but you've also made an effort to use venues that are perhaps not usually used for cultural programmes and performances. You mean about the... The open air the things open and air, squares yes. and, and the factory... Actually, we are trying to find unconventional uh, places to make these performances. So, actually, we are asking them, uh, artists or the groups, to make pe uh, proposals that uh, can fit anywhere. In a park, in a square, in the street, but not in, in the theatre. So it's bringing it to the people more the than people, expecting yes. them to come to you. Yes, yes. This is the basic idea behind this open to the public uh, performances. So where can people find all the details of this? Well, they can visit our website. It's www.kipria.org.cy and uh, through our website they can uh, reach the um, uh, ticket platform where they can uh, purchase their uh, tickets and they can find all information or uh, they can call to our information center that it's uh, 702212. That's easy enough. We've been talking to Andy Vargilis, who's the artistic director of the Kipria Festival. It's already underway, but you've still plenty of time to catch the goodies. Visit www.kipria.org.cy. You can subscribe to the Cypress News Digest on iTunes for free and get the program downloaded to your phone or tablet so you can listen anytime, anywhere. Probably the biggest story this week, certainly on social media, was the outcry when it was discovered that a luxury hotel in the Paphos area was using a bulldozer to clear the beach of a Natura 2000 area where endangered turtles nest. Photos posted online showed baby turtle hatchlings trying to make their way to the sea with a bulldozer in the background. It was all apparently for a very exclusive three-day wedding party at the hotel. But the agriculture minister, Nikos Kouyalis, stepped in to prevent the party taking place on the beach. It will still take place at the hotel, reportedly with Justin Bieber and Christina Aguilera entertaining the guests over the three days. However, it seems for the moment at least the turtles won't be disturbed. What no one seems to realise, of course, is that if they hatch at night, then they tend to head towards where there's light because usually the moon reflects on the sea. If there are lights nearby, then they tend to head inland and then a lot of them perish. Well, that was the big story and it was the public outcry that then brought to light the fact that the district officer of Paphos had given permission for the party to take place without consulting the agriculture minister, who is also, of course, minister of the environment. And some good news. Despite the fact that Greek Cypriots had been prevented from celebrating the feast of Ios Mammas in Morfu because the Turkish Cypriot authorities said that it clashed with the end of Kurban Bayram, in a country where tit-for-tat moves have been really the norm for the last 40 or so years, there was good news because the authorities in the Republic of Cyprus decided that they would allow some 700 Muslim pilgrims to attend the Hala Sultan Teke Mosque in Larnaca to mark the end of Kurban Bayram. In fact, the mosque was closed to other visitors for the day as the pilgrims made their way there, conducted their prayers and then returned to the north of the island. The government spokesman, Nikos Christodoulidis, said that the issue would be taken up with the UN as regards the refusal to allow Greek Cypriots worship in the north, but he went on to say that the enjoyment of religious rights is one of the most basic human rights, and we always respect the enjoyment of religious rights in our country. That, therefore, was why they didn't prohibit the Turkish Cypriots from attending the Teke Mosque. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. Over recent years, the Cyprus Symphony Orchestra has made quite a name for itself as a pretty neat outfit. It's now got a brand new artistic director and maestro, 
all the way from Germany. He is Jens Georg Bachmann, and he joins us now. So you're going to bring something a little different, I think, during your tenure as director of the orchestra. That eventually will also have to be determined by the audiences who listen to us. But I think uh, what I will bring to the orchestra is that we really try to achieve to bring out a unified sound, a unified voice of the orchestra and of this country. We also want, apart from that, offer regular family concerts to anyone who wants to, uh, wants to attend, as much as hopefully five times a year in a pretty regular scheme. We will be collaborating with schools. We uh, will offer neighborhood concerts where we go into all kinds of neighborhoods and play outdoors or inside depending on the climate um, to show that we are there, that we are there for everyone to be heard. We will keep our series of evening concerts of course and hope that anything else as outside of this will attract as many people as we um, hope to that they will join us in the evening for our concerts and we will also continue our chamber concert series in some way where I, if I'm able to, time-wise and uh, repertoire-wise, to collaborate as an accompanying pianist with the musicians of the orchestra. What would you assess generally, I know you can't comment particularly on Cyprus because you've only just arrived, but generally speaking the world over, and you have worked in many different countries, how is classical music doing? You talk about the outreach programs and it is important, isn't it, to draw new audiences in. Is classical music popular among the general population where you go? I would say not enough. And this is our strong mission, to show that it is, has a popular side, that it has an attractive side, something enticing. And I would say if we understand and learn and experience by attending concerts in whichever scope or format that might be, that... Once we go out, our spirits are uplifted and we share enthusiasm and joy through the experience of music that this will make many more audiences think about and decide for the offer we can bring to anybody in this country. Secondly, I would say our mission is also to broaden the output and aside from, my, from what I described is that we try to um, offer uh, recordings of audio as well as video to the Cyprus Broadcasting Corporation that they, they can broadcast it anytime they want and also that this will offer the opportunity for those people in the country who will not logistically be able to come to concerts to hear us play and perform and maybe make a trip or two once a year if they um, are able to uh, organize and manage it to hear us play and perform live. Now I know that you're a proponent of contemporary music which when you're talking about audiences who are not really au fait even maybe with the classical repertoire is a bit dodgy in terms of enticing them in. So it's a bit of a tightrope, isn't it, to create something that will appeal to those who are already in the know without putting off those who actually just want to hear the tunes that they're familiar with. That's, that's very much so the case, I agree. Um, at the moment, I'm testing the waters, I'm testing the grounds, which means I have to find out, can we pair some more courageous or challenging works with works which are very popular and with uh, which everyone else is familiar with? Or do we kind of have to prioritize in terms of more advantageous programs and more um, popular and conservative programs, if we can call it that way? Um, I think a good mixture of both would be wonderful. But apart from that, I think there is no reason why we should not communicate about and talk about what we're doing. So if we do have a living composer who wrote a piece for our orchestra or which is, who, who brought the piece to us and which we will be performing, there is no reason for this composer not to talk about the content and the reason or the, the background of this piece and the reason why he wrote this piece in such a way. So maybe also that the 
audience has the possibility to learn what is behind the idea of that composition, what is, behind, what is inside of the mind of a composer, especially when we consider that most of the pieces we perform are all by dead composers. Right, and that's interesting. So you might actually get the composers where the venue is to talk about the piece before you play it. It's a bit like having an artist there to explain what he had in mind when he painted his picture. Absolutely. I think, I think this, this way of communication is necessary. And it's not just that we have a, a menu prepared for you and we stuff it down your throat. Um, there should be a way where, where you understand that behind everything what we do there is a reason and we think of it very carefully. And if there's something new, something advantageous, maybe something even even um, slightly startling, then there, why shouldn't there be a reason that this is communicated to you directly so you have a fresh mind and fresh ears as you listen to it and the first time it, it's going to be performed. Final question about the collaboration with the youth orchestra and the fact that I know you happen to feel that performing for young children is also very important because if you can engender that love of music in the youngsters, they will grow up with it and it will spread. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, this is part of our mission. But to answer the question, there is this wonderful Cyprus uh, Youth Symphony Orchestra in our country comprised of the best talents we have and the best young musical talents we have in this country. And... I do want to establish a tradition of an annual event where all the youngsters have the poss possibilities, all the members of the Cyprus Youth Symphony Orchestras, in fact, have the possibilities to play and perform side by side with the professionals of the Cyprus Symphony Orchestra. This would mean that we join forces, that we have the possibility to perform pieces which neither of the ensembles, the, neither the Cypress Symphony Orchestra nor the Cypress Youth Symphony Orchestra would be able to perform on their own, and for the audience to hear pieces performed that will not be otherwise be audible, and it will, I think, be a very attractive magnet um, in terms of the uh, performance event. Just imagine that also from here, the expertise of the professionals are passed on in a very immediate and direct way to the musicians of the youth orchestra and with this kind of joint forces and joint resources we open a possibility for development growth and also new discoveries and repertoire the new artistic director and maestro of the Cyprus Symphony Orchestra, Jens Georg Bachmann. And the orchestra will be performing an outreach program on September the 15th at the Faneromeni Square in Old Nicosia. You can find out more if you look on the orchestra's website, www.cyso.org.cy. Get in touch with the Cypress News Digest by emailing cypressnewsdigest at gmail.com. In collaboration with the Cypress Mail, this is the Cypress News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. The biggest achievement of Crime Stoppers has been the ability of the public to be able to give information about crime anonymously. There's no way I could have kept prostituting without the drugs. There's no way I could have had my body used like a public toilet because that's actually what prostitution is. And then the fourth series I started three days after I'd won the Oscar. So the whole of the Monarch of the Glen experience was all interplatted with the Gosford Park Oscar experience. I was working with Ronnie James Dio and David was going to reform White Snake in 2003. Cyprus was chosen because Cyprus is a stable, peaceful and uh, secure place. We have to really look closely what are we doing with children, what are we doing with adolescents and what are we doing with adults that can help them move into a more literate uh, situation. The ones that I'm proudest of are the ones that were true discoveries where we found something we didn't know existed. Coming up on the 19th of September is an outreach program that's taking place in the buffer zone in Nicosia. We're joined by the Venerable Dr. John Holdsworth, Executive Archdeacon of the Diocese of Cyprus and the Gulf, who's organising the event. So, John, what's the idea behind it? 
Well, this will be the second social outreach forum um, that the church has convened. Um, this was an initiative from, from our bishop. Last year, we were aware, particularly, I think, because of the situation with refugees, we were aware from our experience of the camp in Kofinu that there are a large number of different agencies who were all kind of working independently. Um, and that wasn't necessarily to the, the best advantage of the, of the people who were there as refugees. And we could see a need for coordination there. And that began to prompt us to think about the need for coordination in everything we do in terms of social outreach on the island. Now, of course, as Christian churches, um, we have an imperative to social outreach. It's part of what churches are about and for. But we're very aware that most of our churches work with partners, some secular, some non, non-Christian partners. We have a large number of fellow travellers from other denominations, um, even other faiths, or none, who are similarly engaged in programmes of social outreach and they're people that we can partner with. But none of these people talk to each other. There isn't a place on the island, a space, where this can happen. So the idea is that we create that space. We let people know who's doing what. We give them a chance to talk to each other, to network, to see how um, people can best help each other and how through helping each other we can actually help the people that the social outreach is meant to help and to advance. You mentioned refugees, but of course there are lots of other vulnerable groups as well. So I'm presuming that, from what you've just said, this is pretty broad-based and, for example, might reach out towards vulnerable Turkish Cypriots or other communities or groups that maybe are on the fringes of society. Yes, um, I think that we, we kind of divide our, our interests, if you like, into um, refugees and, uh, and itinerant people. And that would include people who are being trafficked and all sorts of things like that. There are particular issues, if you like, around women um, and domestic abuse um, and some family kind of issues and the issue of trafficking. Um, there are issues around poverty, um, quite huge issues around poverty. We don't tend to think in terms of Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots. For example, uh, one of the groups that was present at our first social outreach meeting will be represented again as the SOS Children's Village, which is situated in the north of Nicosia, but it's an international organisation. But it happens in Cyprus to deal with families, orphans, broken families. It presents a kind of residential setting for some children and does a lot of work in the community as well. We don't tend to say, oh, well, they're Turkish Cypriots and, and you know, in the south they're, they're Greek Cypriots, but simply to see that as an issue of family care um, and family breakdown and, to an extent, poverty. And then, of course, there are problems that particularly, I think, affect the expat congregation of age. Issues around care for elderly people, issues around care of dementia sufferers, issues around people with kind of mental health problems, the kind of um, palliative care that's available, which some charities, you know, um, particularly concentrate on. So um, when you put these groups all in touch with each other, working on from last year, what came out of it? I mean, did you find that various groups did hook up with each other to coordinate their efforts and be more effective? I think a lot of people were surprised to find other people who were working in similar fields in different places. And I think that there has been networking. And one of the reasons why we're having this conference at the same time this year is to find out exactly the answer to that question. Um, because we don't want to do this just for the sake of it. We want to do it to make sure that it's actually useful. But from the church's perspective, certainly I think that it's opened, um, it's turned new pages of imagination for some churches. It's shown people what best practice can look like. It's shown churches who are thinking, well, how can we properly respond to the kind of social responsibility that Christian discipleship places on us? Um, it's given people opportunities to think about the kind of areas in which they might be able to work in their, in their own contexts. So I'm hoping that certainly at this meeting we shall hear some good and positive outcomes. I'm aware of some in the... I, I live in Lanka, and uh, I'm aware of some new relationships that have sort of developed 
in Larnaca between um, the churches and the Oasis the refugee group, for example. And uh, there's recently been a new Caritas worker um, setting up a, a Larnaca base, which they haven't had before. Um, they also, from a Roman Catholic perspective, they also work with refugees and with itinerant people. Again, we're able to offer church facilities for them to be able to run an art class for refugee children and things like that. Um, we offer some secretarial kind of help as well as giving financial help to Oasis. And well, we finance, of course, is the bottom line for a lot of these groups, mm. isn't it? Mm. In what way, if any, do the churches help on that score? Because all the churches have also got to do their own fundraising to maintain the churches. I mean, I know St Paul's, when you need renovations and things, there are appeals. So I guess that there aren't too many floating funds around to help some of these groups. I think most of our churches commit themselves to giving 10% of their income away, if you like. Um, in other words, not to spend it on new hymn books and renewing the organ, but to find social need. And that's, that's great. Um, we applaud that. Sometimes those churches need help, perhaps, in identifying where that money can be most useful, and I hope that this is part of that. But also, it isn't always money that people need. Um, one of the key things that every charity needs, apart from money on this island, is, is volunteers. And that's something that the church is often in a very good position to, to help with. And another thing that um, many people are looking for on the island is actually accommodation, in the sense of a place to meet, or a place, you know, because some places are, are very expensive, um, other places are not available, or there's a lot of bureaucracy involved in actually trying to get hold of them. Whereas church facilities, we've all got halls, we've all got places that we can use and make available for, for a wider public use. We also have an opportunity, of course, through the networks that all our members belong to, to spread news about different organisations and to, um, to help to raise their profile. So there are lots of ways, it isn't just money, uh, there are lots of ways in which people can help and... The bottom line for the church is we have an imperative towards social outreach. It's one of the reasons we have church. It's one of the reasons people are Christians. It's one of the, the things that's most attractive to non-Christians about Christians is that they actually are people who want to try and, you know, people who've never been near a church will tell you about the Salvation Army and what wonderful work they do. It's, it's an attractive kind of side of, of Christianity, but an imperative for Christians to help other people who are in need to, to meet human need with loving service. And I presume that when you do this outreach programme on the 19th, you're hoping that there will be attendance perhaps from people who aren't directly involved with one of the organisations that's already said it's going. I know there's a deadline, or there was a deadline, of the 5th of September, as far as I recall. But if anybody listening to this since the deadline's passed wants to find out more, what should they do? Who should they contact? Or can they go along on the 19th and sign up and say, I'll be a volunteer? Well, a couple of things. First of all, the, as you said, the uh, meeting's been held in the buffer zone. That means that people can come from any part of the island. Um, so that's important, and it's, an, it's a statement in its own, in its own right. Um, because we're actually offering a lunch, it's important for us to know how many people are coming. So... Please don't just turn up on the day. Okay. But they, <laughs> do, let get... it, do let us know that you're coming. If you would like to come, then if you get in touch with the Darsen office, the telephone number is 2267-1220, then you'll be able to get a kind of registration letter and, uh, and find out more about the exact details of the day. But we do have a very wide range of participants who have already already indicated that they're going to come. Um, all of our churches, obviously, are going to be represented, but um, also a very wide range of, uh, of organisations, church-based, faith-based, not faith-based. So if you want to join them, you do need to get in touch beforehand or perhaps pay a visit to the offices of the Diocese of Cyprus and the Gulf located next to St Paul's Cathedral in Nicosia. We've been talking to the Venerable Dr John Holsworth, Executive Archdeacon, at the diocese.
Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.